Hello, everyone. I, uh, I realize that we may have folks still coming online, but I wanted to take a moment to welcome everyone to this webinar on gender and social inclusion in international development. Uh, before we begin today, I wanted to take just a moment to thank the Stewardship Foundation for their generous support in this um, making this webinar possible and uh, to share just a few pieces of information that will help to guide participation. Um, we do have French or Spanish translation available. Um, you can find the interpretation button. It's um, marked interpretation with a globe icon, the bottom right hand of your screen to access the service if you need it. You should be able to choose which language. Um, and then please feel free to use the chat function. So um, rather, we, we're not going to use the Q&A box, but please do feel free to use the chat function to pose questions for the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. We'll be monitoring that and sharing questions for the hosts and the panelists. Um, with that, I will turn it over to our host, Shipra, to get us started. And thank you again, welcome. Thank you so much, Margie. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are listening to me in the moment. I'm Shipra and I work with Landessa to strengthen the connection between land and women. I extend a very, very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today from different parts of the world. We have assembled to discuss about the idea of gender and social inclusion to centering humanity in the international development. And to discuss it with me, I'm joined by three very amazing people, all from different geographies. We have Troy Karuna. He's senior associate at the Center for Values in International Development. His current work focuses on integrating applied ethics into development practice to yield more just, equitable, and inclusive processes and outcomes. We have Shelley Martin. Hi, Shelley. Shelley is senior gender and business advisor in the private sector consulting practice of ICRW, International Center for Research on Women. She worked with ICRW advisors, and her work focuses on enhancing equity at work and sustainability in agriculture supply chains. Thank you for joining us, Shelley. We also have Nana Anaira, a land economist, development policy analyst, and gender specialist with over 25 years of experience in land and natural resource governance, land policy research, policy advocacy, and women's land rights. She is the founder and executive director of Polanda, which is a Ghana-based land rights organization. Thank you for joining us, Nana. Thank you for joining us, Troy. Uh, we will take benefit of the knowledge and experience of all of them and learn what brings them to Jesse, gender equity, and social inclusion. How are they applying it in their own context? What challenges have they come across? And what wisdom can they offer to all of us? We intend to devote first 45 minutes for a conversation with them and we'll save the last 15 minutes, nearly 15 minutes, for the questions from our participants. Please introduce yourself in the chat box and use that for any comments and questions. Before I go to the guests, I repeat, uh, we have French or Spanish translations available please find the interpretation button at the bottom right of your screen to access that service if you need it. You can also write your questions or comments in Spanish and French. So now I'll begin with you, Troy. Welcome to this webinar. And Troy, we all in the development sector have long been talking of recognizing the different needs of men and women and making conscious efforts so that the process of development is fair to both men and women and provides them 
equal opportunities. They courted gender equity and have been making relentless efforts uh, such that people working at all levels and in various spaces understand and embrace the idea of gender equity. Now, while we continue to strive for that goal, we have now expanded it to include social inclusion and are calling it gender equity and social inclusion. To be really short, we call it Jesse. Can you help us all understand, Troy, what drives these expansions? What does this mean? And how is Jesse different from talking of just gender equity? To you, Nadra. Thanks, Chipra. Um, and, and I think in order to approach this, I'm going to start with the motivation. So what is it that really drives us to a Jesse approach in the first place? Uh, one of the justifications I often hear is really couched in utilitarian terms or Jesse or social inclusion is an instrumental value. In other words, the idea that inclusivity is going to yield better outcomes in aggregate and maybe project specific outcomes. Uh, two examples that come to mind, for example, um, increasing women's participation and participation of LGBTQI persons in economic, formal economic affairs is going to yield larger aggregate economic productivity. Um, and, you know, um, development, if we get more voices in and it is more inclusive of marginalized and typically vulnerable groups, it can lead to more positive outcomes by uh, ideas, generations, more buy-in, et cetera. And while this is all true, I think there's an important piece missing here, which is, I think what should and really does drive this Jesse approach is the moral obligation to recognize the dignity of others, right? The idea that all individuals have the capacity to, to feel pleasure, pain, they have aspirations, goals, and are really pursuing what they perceive to be a meaningful life full of relationships um, and what they see as a life of excellence and thriving. Um, of course, that's going to mean different things to different people in different areas, but it's important to realize that everyone has these basic capacities. Um, and furthermore, recognizing that if we're taking equality seriously, all of these people have an equal right to pursue these ends. Um, so there's no inherent reason why one person ought to have priority over another. So I think this is definitely something the Jesse approach takes into consideration by recognizing there are obstacles that people face in their attempt to flourish, um, or what Martha Nussbaum calls it, leading a truly human right life. Um, the idea that these core elements such as life, health, and even a level of control over one's social and material environments are often left lacking for certain groups. So I think that's kind of shadow or uh, foreshadowing what the Jesse approach does, right? It recognizes that certain genders face unique barriers in their thriving. Um, you know, typically women, LGBTQI persons really have a higher incidence of poverty, social exclusion, and um, thus we need to identify what these unique challenges are that they face and then really take extra steps. That's the whole equity piece, right? That, that not just equality, same thing for everyone, but the equity piece. And really working to help these individuals and groups overcome these barriers. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Troy. And I'm so glad you talked about the moral obligation, human values, and spirits of humility being at the core of Jesse approach. I think that certainly this should be the key principle underlying human connection and should be a non-negotiable in development efforts. Nana, I turn to you now, and I'm curious to learn from you on what can you tell us from your experience in Ghana about the relevance of Jesse approach as opposed to gender equity. To you, Nana. Thank you very much, Shipra. So yes, we in Ghana, especially for my organization, Colande, working on land rights, we have always known that the outcomes of our interventions would not necessarily be gender neutral. That it is almost always the case that 
the outcomes of our intervention will likely include and benefit some category of people in the society that we work much more than others. Because of this awareness, for many years, the two main categories that have engaged our attention are the male and female categories. And therefore, in our work and in many of the work that development actors in Ghana have focused on, the development programs have focused on unpacking the different needs and interests of these two categories, male, female, and purposively strategizing to get all of them involved and to be part of the benefits. This is because it was understood that there is a certain socially constructed relationships expected to exist between women and men in the societies in which they live, which in turn influence the different roles and responsibilities that they play in those societies. At that time, that is what we considered that gender is about and what the point of um, interest as far as making development sensitive to all categories of society was concerned. But after many decades of practicing gender, it is now evident that there are many more factors that affect relationships and that affect inclusion opportunities than merely being male or female. An example in Ghana is that women face structural challenges in securing land rights. And therefore, all land rights projects give attention to specific strategies of ensuring that women get a chance to be part of the process and benefit from securing land rights. While this is so important and it is still relevant even today, we have also come to realize that there are non-indigenous smallholder farmers there are undocumented land rights holders and many other categories. Both men and women in these other categories also face challenges with exclusion, with power relations, with negative impacts of these power relations, which affect opportunities for them in securing land rights. The power dynamics, the participation in decision making and benefit sharing are therefore challenges for all farmers in these categories beyond just being male, female. Therefore, empowering all such people in these categories is what the focus is. And as the World Bank puts it, it's an attempt to get all to participate in and benefit from the development process, which is so important to us. That is the Jesse approach. Jesse approach therefore encompasses policies to promote equality and non-discrimination by improving access of all people, including the poor and disadvantaged, to services and benefits. It also embraces actions to remove the barriers against those who are often excluded from the development processes, such as, of course, the women, such as the migrants or the non-indigenous, such as the children, the youth, persons with disability, whether male or female, minorities, and so on and so forth. It is to ensure that the voices of such ones are heard and are part of the conversation in development. There is no doubt that the Jesse approach requires some level of detailing and strategizing, but it is such a valuable approach because it demonstrates our understanding of the society and the dynamics that exist within that society. And it creates the opportunity to work towards outcomes that reflects on the society and helps to improve our skills in dealing with all manner of diversity within the society. Therefore, by being gender sensitive alone does not mean net contributions from gender mainstreaming will have an overall positive effect. As we have seen, it could negatively even impact some other diversity groups. Therefore, it's important that we consider the Jesse approach as a holistic approach that make development outcomes more transformative and sustainable. And that is how we have approached it from Ghana. And it has been quite some time approaching it from this way. And it's been such a wonderful experience transitioning from gender to Jesse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nana, Emma, for explaining that further and for sharing your insights. Jesse approach, as you rightly said, is really a matter of 
widening the lens beyond just gender binaries and considering other intersections and other vulnerabilities of all contexts and considering thoughtfully who may be affected by our work. Shelly, now I'll turn over to you. Uh, you have been working on agriculture value chains. I'm curious to know how do you find the Jesse approach relevant and helpful there in agriculture value chains specifically? Thanks, Shipra. I think that's a great question. And as Nana Ama alluded to, around the world, we find that gender is never not a variable. So it's always in the mix. And we know from history that women have faced these disadvantages based on gender inequalities. So the question that the Jesse lens asks us to consider is in a specific context, that specific market context where you might be working, social context, which other identity factors shape who expands and who shrinks in the systems that we've engineered. So in my work, that's in mostly relation to economic opportunity and ultimately it comes down to who holds power. So I'm really motivated to ask not only are women economically empowered by this program or this investment, but which women? For example, I work with sustainable sourcing teams of food and beverage companies to foster more equitable and prosperous supply chains, including with large landowners in South Asia and South America. And a core objective of our interventions is to strengthen women's visible participation. On the whole, their contribution is virtually invisible to large companies. Um, it often happens behind the scenes. They may not hold any contracts under the current ways of working. So we could set a target of say 30% of women participants in a particular regenerative agriculture demonstration. But our efforts are gonna miss the mark on both the social equity, the sort of impact case, and the long-term supply chain and productivity and resilience, um, that's the business case that Troy was alluding to, if we count it a success to merely invite the easiest to locate women. So the wealthy, the higher caste, the wives of current large men supply, large landowners who are men supplying the companies. And in many cases, we find that um, those individuals may not even aspire to be involved in agribusiness. So it doesn't really meet our objectives. So then perhaps we specify, okay, this program is going to address barriers to entering commercial supply chains faced by farming women who are marginal landholders in a certain region. In that case, the Jesse lens also leads us to ask who else besides our target women are systematically marginalized from the benefits of an investment like those made by large buyers? Who could even be harmed by its impacts? For instance, certain groups of men could also be excluded from a program or investment, like men who migrate to sustain our food system, but they lack papers in that country where they labor. So in our work in Colombia in supply chains, we would be remiss to only help Colombian women in securing identification and bank accounts when maybe their coworkers include refugees from Venezuela, women and men, who also deserve those tools to secure decent work in their new home. Um, so we have to get specific, sorry, my dog is joining the conversation. We have to get specific about which women and also learn to mitigate the other kinds of risks to prevent unintended consequences and backlash against um, the women who may make it uh, less attractive or, or less feasible for even those target populations to participate. Thank you, Shelley. You have brought up a really very significant aspect which Jesse recognizes that one size fits all approaches are not effective. And we really have to be mindful of people's realities in different contexts and how different identities intersects to uh, form their realities. Uh, at Landessa also we designed a Jesse framework last year we then encouraged our teams across the globe to pilot it in their own context. It was really encouraging to see people making conscious efforts to think about and include people on the margins, such as divorced women in China, youth in Tanzania, scheduled tribes and single women in India, and how every team found that this approach helps us be more, more mindful about our goals. Troy, I'll turn to you now again, and would like to know how are you seeing development organizations or different governments move towards a Jesse approach? 
Yeah, so I think for this question, I'm just going to speak a little bit about my time in uh, the Peace Corps. I was in Peace Corps, been in for three years. And in addition to teaching English language classes at a rural secondary school, I was coordinating our gender equity youth development work. Um, and I was actually really excited to see. So that was from 2016 to 2019. Uh, but the program was very focused and very determined to focus on on Jesse work, even though they weren't calling it that at the time. Um, I think my two big takeaways from this work was really to recognize you can't focus on individuals in isolation from the larger context in which they're living. So that's to say there's often a focus on empowering certain genders. Um, but at once, you also need to address the larger structures in which these individuals are operating. I'll, I'll get into the details about that. And I think, secondly, the importance of including men, uh, women, and non-binary persons in every activity, right? The fact that you don't want to focus on just one or the other. Um, so really quickly, we had a bunch of programs we would focus on for youth development and gender e equity across the country. One in particular was the student internship program in which um, we'd work with communities to select one male and one female student from that community um, to bring them to Cotonou for an entire month where they would stay with a host family. Uh, they would be placed with an organization such as Plan International Care, Catholic Relief Services. Uh, we even had Marie Elise Bedo. Um, in on this, so she was the first female president candidate in Benin. Uh, and so there were plenty of organizations that we would pair these individuals up with so that they could learn a various set of skills, both hard skills, soft skills. They could begin to develop a network in the commercial capital of Cotonou uh, and also connect with like minded peers that are in high school. Um, quite often, by the end of the month, we would see great success with the students. You know, they were exposed to new ideas. They had learned very important, valuable skills and even just their sense of what is possible by putting them in a different setting, having them with, um, you know, Beninese host families to serve as mentors. You know, um, they went from seeing occupations around their village, maybe being a nurse or something to that effect with goals of maybe working at an airport or taking um, you know, going to university and, and having new goals. Um, but part of the challenge, of course, was we didn't really, in Peace Corps at the time, we weren't structurally dealing with the various social configurations in the village, so that when you would send these young girls and these young boys back, they would often face the discrimination and the marginalization that they face. So yes, they may have been empowered, if you will, um, but lacked the opportunity to exercise that. And I think secondly, just to stress the importance of working with men and boys and the fact that it, it really does tie into that behavioral change, um, making sure, as Shelley said, there's no backlash for this opportunity, but recognizing the importance. So just takeaways of working with all genders and treating the structural components as well as developing skills for individuals. Thank you, Troy. You talked about the challenges uh, as well as necessity of working with people of different identities. I think it's most urgent to work where it is really more difficult. You mentioned about non-binary people, Troy, and it's so difficult to talk about their land rights, the entire language of law, including that of the land laws. It's based on gender binaries and doesn't recognize the presence of anyone beyond the gender identities in most of the countries. And unless we pay conscious attention to this, we tend to really miss. Uh, Nana, I'm coming over to you again, and I'm curious to know what challenges did you face in embracing Jesse approaches in Ghana? Well, so fortunately for us in Ghana, a new land act was passed in 2020. And in that new land act, we made a lot of advocacy efforts 
to integrate the Jesse elements of land rights and land rights protection in the new land act. So for example, in the current act, all types of land rights, both by women and other vulnerable groups are recognized under the law. And there are facilities for documenting land rights at the local level, which is what affected many vulnerable groups of the population in Ghana. So it's, it's there for smallholder farmers, for both indigents and non-indigents, for male, female, for youth, and so on. That system is there in terms of the legal framework. And in terms of the institutional setup, Ghana has made some progress by decentralizing the land uh, service. But the truth of the matter is that having the law is one part, but the norms around the application of the law is another. Because many of the Ghanaian population, as it was in the time of gender, still is the case with Jesse that many don't believe in it. Many don't think it's a real issue. Many think that we all have the opportunities and so we should all be able to access and benefit and so on. So that is a real challenge. And because the issues affect the individuals and yet the opportunity to bring themselves out of it goes beyond the individual to the institutional and the systemic, it's difficult for such one to take advantage of their law. In Ghana, yes, we have some level of awareness. So people are aware that, well, there is beyond gender other issues of diversity. So awareness, understanding, and appreciation exist. But we are at a point where there is limited skills for analysis, for strategy, for integration. And so it makes it difficult that even people who believe in it and who see the critical need for it lack the skills and the capacity to act. Again, when you go to the local level, that is where Jesse actions are important, but there is limited and there is exp it's expensive and time consuming to operate at that level because it requires a whole lot of unpacking and detailing, which takes time and efforts and resources to undertake. And finally, I just want to talk about the risk of falling back into the gender approach. You know, we have just explained how important it is that in looking at issues of diversity, we go beyond the male, female to other categories, which include both male and female who are disadvantaged. But every now and then we see that there is the opportunity, I mean, there is the, the risk of falling back into the gender approach and not focusing on the Jesse approach, which is a challenge that we are dealing with at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Uh, we actually faced some of the very similar dilemmas and some challenges and realized that it really helps to have a clear understanding of power in terms of both the power structures and power relations, who owns power and how this, this power works and who is remain powerless and in what context. Uh, I'll come to you, Shelley, and would want to understand how did you grapple with Jesse-based challenges in agriculture value chains? Sure, yeah. We'll continue with the example I shared earlier. I think there's a number of opportunities for the larger corporations to consider Jesse and their sourcing operations. So when you think about the practices contained within this, what are the outreach channels and the customary ways of interacting with potential suppliers? What are their land and volume and experience requirements that would make somebody eligible to supply? And what kinds of contracting mechanisms do they use? Do they allow co-farmers to sign up from the same household or plot? Which, you know, in terms of staffing, which personnel are engaging those suppliers? Do they have any women? Do they have any local dialect speakers in farmer facing roles? So these variables all work together to systematically include or exclude certain groups. And it's usually inadvertent. So this is something I wanna to touch on because the absence of formal discrimination doesn't mean that everyone is included and, and belongs in the supply chain. 
It's important because some of our partners can miss the, the core challenge if they see, well, women are not prohibited from participating. Uh, it's like all she needs to do is have the assets and the market relationships and the historical standing of a more powerful person and the confidence to be a first mover in a space that's been dominated by, by other career businessmen or um, you know, other people who speak the language, who have the social capital, and then they're welcome. So of course that's easier said than done. And when we apply the Jesse lens, we can situate that potential supplier in their social reality. So if we zoom in, we're in Uttar Pradesh, India, and we realize it's not exclusively her sex that determines how far she can go in agribusiness. More broadly now, we're thinking about the social norms around someone's gender, caste, class, marital status, ethnicity, religion, and all the resulting social structures that work to divert power away from people with certain identities, which is why they tend to remain with inferior access to land, finance, and markets. So you mentioned the human dignity case, and I agree that women, migrants, and other marginalized groups deserve to benefit from commercial markets and investments in the sector that they have long sustained. And from a business perspective, Buyers in this scenario, uh, there's a case based on the value of diversification to small and medium scale farms. So people with less social and economic power may fall into this category. Women especially hold huge potential here because they represent 60 to 80% of smallholders and non-industrialized economies. And then further, when we think about agribusiness, it's strategic because you're future-proofing the supply chain. It's a more stable food system for all of us. These turbulent times that we've all been sitting through Demand is skyrocketing, climate shocks are threatening production, and men increasingly move to industries that um, are off farm, placing women and other marginalized groups back in rural areas at the center of food security. So it will take some skillful reworking of those sourcing practices to effectively integrate them, to bring women and other excluded farmers into the fold as commercial suppliers. But some companies that have that strong sustainability lens are already making those shifts. Thank you, Shelley, for sharing your experiences and thoughts with us. And given your on ground experience of working with women farmers that come from different identities, and also at the same time of working with some of the corporates and big companies, I want to follow up with you on any suggestions that you would offer to those trying to build an Jesse lens into their work. Yeah, I think we're in this needed moment of reckoning I, in, you know, the private sector, we often speak about diversity, equity and inclusion, DEI. And so DEI issues um, and belonging in the formal workplace is a conversation, but how can we widen that aperture from the internal DEI to what the, the, the environmental sustainability folks would call scope three. So the impact that's your whole social footprint. And that's really no small tax. So for some companies we work with, the challenge is just the belief that DEI in supply chains is either low urgency or maybe it's relevant, but there's this perception of very high upfront costs to identify and plan with that DEI lens. So others have mentioned it can be quite nuanced. Gender and diversity data is needed for us to design and manage and measure well, but it can be costly to get started. And when we're thinking about historical marginalization, that's very contextual. So the very tidy data sets that we too often plan and analyze with, they're built on binaries, they look at gender gaps, um, and then they don't tend to look at those intersecting factors. And further, a DEI lens and supply chains also requires coordination of many players within different business units who use different performance metrics. So it's a lot of coordination effort up front. Um, but I wanna make um, a, a case for it because for example, some logistics or agronomics experts, they could be working in supply chains, activities that they are concerned with, like distributing seeds or fulfilling whole shiploads of potatoes, that could seem neutral. It doesn't seem to require an approach that centers humanity. But in reality, a margin of their success is attributable to others in research and design, in farm finance, in supplier registration, training, all these steps long before crops reach the farm gate and that margin is significant. So if we zoom back in and we're now working um, in West Bengal, India, what if Bengali speaking Muslim Indian women are left out of any of those stages, but they account for the majority of the manual labor during potato production? 
would that omission affect those logistics and agronomics professionals performance related to those things downstream? I think it definitely would. So my sort of entreaty for those working in the business world would be that we would see the social side of sustainability and awakening staff to the social elements that can enable their work to succeed this quarter and in 20 years from now is how we're going to unlock that transition to a Jesse or a DEI approach within the private sector that has huge influence. As partners in this work, we have the opportunity to begin shifting from the short-term or even seasonal mindset that many of these professionals have vis-a-vis -vis the long-term commitments that equity and true sustainability requires. Thank you for that guidance, Shirley. Uh, you made really a very good point of prioritizing long-term goals over short-term benefits and making investments for the larger good and doing business responsibly. I again turn to you, Nana. Uh, the development sector, it, it mostly operates on a project-based approach, which are like generally short-term. So what are some of your learnings from managing projects and programs that others can benefit from? Thank you. So one of the key lessons is that Jesse is really about the way the society is organized and the way they operate, just that. And therefore we should not make it complicated. We should simplify the approach, make it practical and tell it to the society. It is just that because in the development context, you are operating in a community, a settlement, an organization and so on. And within this system are already the way of, they are organized. And therefore tailor the approach to that system and that is just how it is. So when you simplify it, it makes it simpler for the people to understand and incorporate and it makes it easier to sustain whatever approach that are introduced. The other thing is also that we need to also look at the Jesse approach from an institutionalized point of view. You don't need just a focal person and that makes it a Jesse approach. No, in many organizations, you realize that as you try to build their capacity, then they get someone they will call, and, and that was actually from the gender work. They call a Jesse focal person. And this focal person is supposed to work with everyone else in the institution or in the organization or in the community to get Jesse done. It helps to have a focal person, but it's better when Jesse is institutionalized so that beyond the focal person, there are actually people, all of them, who actually understand the concepts, who believe in it, who appreciate what needs to be done, and who actually gets committed to doing it. There is also the other bit, which is the transition from Jesse, from gender to Jesse. And I think from my own work and from the way Landessa and other international organizations are approaching, I think making that purposive mm -hmm. shift is important. It does not have to be just on the spare of the moment. It has to be purposive. When it is purposive, that is when you think broader than just the little one you are seeing and it, you are able to capture everything that is involved under the Jesse perspectives as far as the project is concerned. And that way, it enhances opportunity for very good impact and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Thank you, Nana. You are really very right. Simplification is the key. It will help people understand the concepts and embrace the approach. And in our efforts at Landesa, we realized that the way in which Jesse issues are articulated in project documents is extremely important because this provides the frame of preference for how gender imbalances, social exclusion, and other inequalities will be understood and addressed during implementation. A mention in the project framework also helps contextualize the inequalities or marginalizations in a specific context. Uh, Troy, we are approaching the end of the conversation and what words of encouragement or caution 
would you offer to make Jesse more meaningful and impactful in international development work? Right, I'll be brief. I'm excited to, to get to the Q&A and, and hear everyone's thoughts on this conversation. Um, but I think I am encouraged to see the transition um, that we're now talking about gender instead of specifically talking only about women um, and gender more broadly, right? Like as this conversation is reflected, recognizing the performative nature and that we're not just talking about men and women, but also uh, non-binary persons. Um, and also the fact that this does present opportunities for working with all genders towards the end of social inclusion and equality. Um, I think one thing I'll reemphasize is while all of these elements are in the conversation that we've had today, it's important that we understand Jesse to be premised on the recognition of human dignity, right? The idea that this is something inherent to all individuals. And I think that entails acknowledging intersectionality, um, which we have, but the fact that gender is not the sole basis that people are excluded from opportunities. Um, but there are many facets of one's identity, uh, such as race, ethnicity, religion, disability status, etc. cetera. Uh, and then these should also be considered. So I, I kind of see Jesse as a component of the larger approach of inclusive development. Um, it is necessary to have a frame, but keeping in mind, it is towards that end of overall inclusive development. Um, so yeah, I mean, just making sure that when we do this kind of work, we're always working with humility, developing trust, and really uh, keeping that foundational concept in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Troy, and thanks for reminding that very important aspect that effort towards Jesse have to be rooted in human empathy and dignity. And it's not just about including people on the margins, it's about making efforts so that they have a sense of belonging. And at the organizational levels, it should certainly become part of an organizational ethos and values at all levels. So uh, I think it's right time. We can now turn over to the participants' questions. And uh, I see there is a question from a participant, maybe uh, Shirley, I think it's specifically addressed to you. And the participant says, uh, a participant wants to know how the current push for ESG, environmental, social, and governance aspects, and shared measurements may be helpful in the supply chain coordination that you were discussing, Shelly. Great, thank you for that question, Erin. Um, I think ESG can help. I think the frameworks that are out there today don't go far enough to ensure inclusive development like we're talking about in, in this call. Um, the social data in those frameworks is usually limited to the S, the environmental, social, and governance. So the types of questions that they're considering are about livelihoods, resilience in origin communities, sourcing communities, and it typically comes from a risk perspective. So like, don't fail to consider these social and political risks of investing in this market or it could affect your business, rather than how can we do better by the people in these communities and possibly also mitigate risk or capture value. Um, but for the sake of more inclusive development. So they're coming from different perspectives, but I think there's some overlap. Uh, a pitfall is that they're too homogenized. So when we look at the descriptions of indicators in the ESG frameworks, it's often about like local people and supplier communities, which are actually very diverse. And the power dynamics we've been discussing today um, create many different opportunities and um, setbacks for people within those communities. So I think we can bring a more contextual lens that uses intersectional diversity data, like Troy mentioned, um, that considers other social factors there. So which people are benefiting? Um, who is marginalized? Um, and then kind of keeping that diversity lens as a cross-cutting factor across the E, S, and G. Because there are social elements of the environmental work, and there's absolutely social elements in governance. So 
Um, beginning, I think it's often easiest from a data perspective to, to gender disaggregate, but beginning to bring that more nuanced lens to the data in the E and G, as well as the S of those frameworks, I think will really help us get further um, in leveraging the private sector for inclusive development. Uh, thank you, Shelley. And there is another question, I think, uh, since you are talking of women farmers and their uh, their collective farming, probably you can answer this uh, better again, uh, because Indian government is promoting collective farming and farm related activities through formation of farmers collectives. Uh, have you come across any women collectives and specifically farmer producer organizations? Yeah, and I know I'm, there's many on the on the line that I admire today that are working specifically with FPOs, with farmer producer organizations, including some work that I think Landessa has been a part of, um, for instance, in, in West Bengal, India, through some partnerships there that include um, formation of groups that help women overcome some of the barriers to entry in commercial farming. And um, a lot of that does come down to land leasing, uh, land access if you don't have ownership. But in keeping with our sort of theme today, I could imagine um, a more inclusive approach to FPOs in general so that women can take part, but others who also are marginalized from um, finance, from land holding, um, from other sort of productive assets and resources that you need to get started in agribusiness, they can access them together. You see examples of um, people forming tool libraries, um, specifically some of the programs that the Indian government has set up to help people address the transition to regenerative agriculture through collectives. Um, I think there's a lot more we can be done and to sort of take the fear away from working with these groups. Um, I think our, our development community can do more to market them and to to advocate for them as um, suppliers that should not be viewed as risky, but as high potential to companies. And I don't know if others on the line wanna say more since I know that you're also working with, with collectives to overcome some of those barriers, but it's a great question. Yeah, I think you're right, Shelly, sitting in India. I really know that there are uh, quite a few uh, farmer producer organizations which are run and owned by women. And there are organizations and people, including Landasa, who are making really sincere efforts to women, uh, to empower women so that they are not just part of the FPOs, but also lead those FPOs on their own terms. So there really are uh, 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 some good examples to share. So another question which I see, uh, and I think uh, Nana, either you or Troy, you might want to take it. Uh, and, the, and the person is asking, do any of the panelists have any successful experience to share where men and boys are actively contributing to Jesse goals alongside other genders? Yeah, I can uh, share an example once again from Peace Corps. And that's one of the points I tried to emphasize in the talk today is the importance of having men and boys be a part of this. Um, so in Benin, one of my colleagues, uh, one of my male colleagues, actually, after uh, conducting a lot of trainings and, and a lot of discussions on the nature of gender, exclusion, and inclusivity, uh, he started an after school club at our local middle school, and he would regularly get about 20 to 30 students that would come and he would focus the activities on things such as poetry and theater so that it was engaging for the students, but he would often incorporate themes of um, you know, just challenging themes such as, for example, um, women often, young girls often have to, uh, aren't able to complete school at the same rate that boys are over there. So what are the factors? Is this fair? And really kind of provoke those discussions with the students to really challenge notions of um, masculinity or these, these patriarchal assumptions and values. And so I think coming from a male teacher, that was really important. And then also doing it in an engaged way with the youth 
I think that was really important. Naturally, it's a long time. It's tough to measure the impacts, but it was really great to see how he was getting across. Oh, yes. Thank you. And so I just want to add to that. Yeah, please go ahead, Nana. Sorry, I'm sorry. So I just wanted to add to what um, Troy said. And I think the fact that Troy is part of the panel in this discussion in itself is a demonstration. It's an example of having boys and men supporting this Jesse, um, you know, agenda. Because Previously, you would hardly have a male member of our discussion highlighting the issues and advocating for some of the things Troy has presented on this panel. So that in itself is an example. But in addition to what I just said, I mean, in Ghana, we have quite a number of some of these things happening. In many of the um, share not collect collection communities. You have, you know, in Ghana, share collection is mainly a female dominated activity. And so you have women in the community walking distances to go and collect the share nuts. Now in Ghana, you have some traditional leaders, local chiefs who are males who are supporting to provide the, the um, huts where the women gather to prepare the nuts for um, sale. We have, they have created marketplaces for people to come. You have quite a number of husbands supporting their women, their wives to actually um, travel to the distances where this collection is done for them to be able to benefit from it. And now at the household level, you have household members supporting the economic activities that women are engaged in. So you see the male child supporting the mother in the mother's small business that they are doing. You have the male child supporting the mother to carry the item from the farm to the market for sale and so on and so forth. If you come to the community level, we have community leaders, traditional council that is sitting to discuss and decide on matters of interest to you know, both um, women and girls in the society. So to a large extent, there is a positive shift towards improvements. But what we are saying is that it does not have to be isolated. We need to have it as a collective so that beyond these isolated positive impacts, we can have a collective impact from all these you know, interventions at all level, community level, household level, community level, and of course the institutional level to come together for a big impact. Thank you for those additions, Nana. And then I really agree in years of my experience of working with in rural areas and also with the governments, both state and national, I think you find men as allies more often than we know really are. It's because I think they are also humans like us and it's a matter of just understanding the ideology that's keeping women or any other uh, uh, identity groups at the margins. And once people really understand, I have really seen a lot of men in rural areas and also a lot of government officials, you know, becoming an ally in the struggle of rights for uh, marginalized sections, including women. So thank you for adding that and thank you for helping that, helping understand that, Troy and Nana. Uh, another participant is asking if one of you can give some examples of common challenges in implementing a Jesse framework, taking some examples of how you have overcome these challenges. I wonder who amongst you would like to take this. But well, maybe I can start and then my other panelists can add to it. But yeah, one, sure. one of the very fundamental challenges we have is the fact that the issues of exclusion from a Jesse perspective has its underpinning 
from culture and traditions. Just like we see in Kenya, it's the same with Jesse. So in Ghana, for example, we facilitate consultations in communities around large scale projects. And traditional leaders will say that in our area, the culture is that if you are a migrant from another community to our community, you don't participate in our community consultations. That is cultural. That is tradition. And it is part of what influences the Jesse um, observations we make today. The other thing is also about the power dynamics. So people feel that because I am of this class or I am of this category, I have more rights, I am more powerful than you. And it is power over, and therefore that makes it difficult to deal with. It's also institutional. So it is not just me saying, but it's part of the way we have lived, it's part of the system we have operated, it's part of the institutions that has run the society. Because of these three big endemic factors underpinning Jesse, it makes it very, quite not a simple thing to unpack and to deal with just at a go. But the truth is that it's possible to deal with them. And usually our approach is to just provide simple sensitization on the impacts of this approach, I mean, of, of this situation on the community, on the society themselves, all of them. So if you are the one who is advantaged, what are the impacts, negative impacts, if you exclude the other? And usually with this kind of sensitization, right from the beginning, we don't even wait to do whatever analysis to unpack and I think, no, we just enter with a sensitization. That way people get to understand and appreciate and they become aware of themselves. So before you even begin to unpack and discuss it, they themselves will point out to you, these are the differences and this is what we need to work on. Thank you, Nana. And I wanted to check if Shelly, you would, or you would like to comment on this question. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's a real um, sort of personal check on myself when I consider this question and some of the challenges of implementing a Jesse framework. So as humans, we're most able to empathize with things that we identify with. So if I identify as um, a white cis straight woman sitting in North America, the things that come to mind to me that are discriminatory or exclusive might be related to sexism in the workplace, um, you know, things that could affect my life. Now I have to take on a lens of learning and of empathy to understand other people in the areas where we're supporting programming. Um, you know, what are the types of discriminations or exclusions that they would experience? So one good practice that we would recommend is in developing, for example, a non-discrimination policy with um, a local organization or supplier to a supply chain. Do you have a consultative process to let workers and those involved in that company locally help set the tone for what are the examples for the, the types of discrimination they might experience? I might think about, um, you know, pregnancy discrimination in a formal workplace, but how does that look in an agricultural setting where people are informal workers? So putting processes in place for workers to have a voice will help surface some of those things that um, can bring more dimensionality to a Jesse lens so that it does, doesn't come from a north to south direction that is very um, driven by people who may experience some forms um, of, of social marginalization, but don't really know the market setting. So I think those are some of the ways that I'm having to check my own um, identity politics in this work and make sure the framework reflects the people on the ground who are participating in the programs. Thank you, Shelley. And we have one last minute left in Troy. I wanted to check if you have any last comments to offer, any closing remarks. Yeah, so I, I think to build off of Shelley's point, um, it's important not to assume what values are in other places that we work, especially, you know, headquarters and the places we're doing work outside of DC. It's important to really take the time to listen, to build trust, to talk to civil society organizations and understand what does it mean to be honored and respected in this area? You know, what does that look like? What practices are informing that? And then I, I think that's very much so behind the push for localization. So just that modesty and getting clear on values as we do this work. 
thank you so much, Troy. That's such an insight at the end. And thank you, everyone. We are just by the time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, all the panelists, for such an insightful and engaging discussions. Thank you so much. Glad to be a part. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody.